So whereas our previous episode was for the women, in this video, if you are a man, you need to watch this until the end because what I'm about to reveal could happen to you. In less than half an hour, you will gain over 10 years of experience because real talk, this story makes the Wolf of Wall Street look like Lil Red Riding Hood. So today, we're gonna take a look at Diddy's second and most recent lawsuit, which is rumored to be behind the federal raid of all of Diddy's houses. Where after the raid, the feds have confirmed to have found two things, weapons and tapes. Lots of tapes of people in very compromising positions. And this whole thing was all kicked off by a lawsuit filed by a music producer named Rodney Jones. And his 75 page lawsuit exposes the dark and ugly side of Sean P. Diddy Combs. Today, you are gonna see exactly how Diddy became part of the top 1% of American hip hop. And you're also gonna see why the rest of the top 1% even agree to work with this fool. Now, for legal reasons, I have to say that everything I'm about to reveal herein is alleged and rumored because it is possible that all 75 pages with video receipts and photo receipts of this lawsuit is completely made up all by a little known record producer from the little tiny town of Chicago. There's a lot of particular threats and everybody's just telling me what he's allegedly capable of. It's very scary for myself and you know, it has me worried about my kids. It's possible. So to be clear, we are not trying to defame anyone, no. I'm gonna be all your beef, fool. And also, most of you already know the Huang Biao issue. So we will use coded words such as female professional athletes and uncooked eggs and training sessions and people ingesting illegal stuff to be safe. So with all that out of the way, I hope you got on your diving suit and your snorkel because we are about to dive deep into the abyss of the dark side of hip hop. Hold on to your butts. So in any labor reliant industry from film to cooking to even fashion, an employer's greatest fear is that their employee will bounce and head to another company. Or even worse, they'll take everything they learned from you, your SOP and even your clients and open up their own company, becoming your direct competition. And the exact same thing is true in the music industry. Record labels will invest millions in singers, songwriters, rappers, and even DJs. And once these people become famous, a lot of them try to renegotiate their contract. Or even worse, they bounce and create their own record label to compete with the record label that brought them up. So needless to say, coming from the record label's perspective, controlling these artists is priority number one. And today's lawsuit focuses on how Diddy does exactly Exactly that. And the protagonist of this story is Rodney Jones, AKA Lil Rod, a music producer who has been making records for singers and bands since he was the age of 12. He is technically considered a musical prodigy. He's kind of like Sherlock Holmes or Rain Man, but instead of a photographic memory, my man has a phonographic memory. And musical geniuses like Rodney are heavily sought after by some of the top record labels in the world. And one such top record label is Motown Records. For nearly 80 years, Motown has been exposing some of the most influential black artists to the entire world. From Michael Jackson to Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, the Migos, and most recently, Diddy. And this is where our story begins. Because just a few months ago, Diddy put out the Love Album on Motown Records. And back in 2022, both them and Diddy sought Rodney Jones to produce over one third of the songs on this album. And as a result, Rodney had to live with Diddy for over 13 months, traveling all across the United States, not only making music, but also video documenting all of their travels. Which is why this lawsuit contains so much video and photo evidence, you could literally take it all and create your own documentary. And the ironic part is, all of this was done at Diddy's command. It was all his idea. And now all of it is being used as evidence for his alleged dark twisted crimes. Yes, Yana, we are about to examine all of it. Now this is what the music industry is all about. Question, how do you control a genius who's much smarter than you? You compromise them, you corrupt them to the core, make them commit some crimes, and then you keep the evidence. This is one of the many methods that Diddy used to maintain control over his artists. Just like in the movies, Diddy had a vast network with access to some of the most beautiful women in the world. And a lot of these women were uh, professional athletes. And some of these women were uncooked eggs. So part of Diddy's process is he would get these girls and his artists in the same room, get some alcohol and some illegal substances to make everyone go wild. And on some occasions, many of them would even go unconscious. But you know what? So I'm gonna allow you to listen directly from the mouth of a former rapper of Bad Boy Records and the mentor of Diddy, Mark 
Curry. When we go to the club, we used to have these bottles, right? And on this bottle, they'd be, they be regular Moet bottles. On them bottles right there, they'd be to have something to make the girls be real, real slippery and all of this kind of stuff. So when you get up, they'd be like, don't touch them bottles right there and only drink them bottles right there. So we already knew what the drill was. You just don't mess with them bottles, right? Then all of the girls is in the club after a while. They all running, opening up their mouth like little birds. He's running around just popping pills in their mouth. Pop, pill, 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 pill. And then that was the party. But all of the females that was in it, that's what they wanted. It was part of the hip hop culture. We ain't see nothing wrong with it until Bill Cosby got in trouble. He did one too many. Good God. So this went down in the 90s and the 2000s back in the day. Apparently, this SOP is alive and well in 2024. And according to Rodney's lawsuit, there's one person who's in charge of spiking them drinks, none other than Diddy's son, Christian Combs. So you remember back in our previous episode when we talked about how Diddy compromised Cassie, how he got her completely blackout drunk, then he got her to ingest some uh, illegal stuff, and now she's completely out of her mind. And most importantly, she is vulnerable. Take some photos, take some videos, and now Diddy can completely devour and compromise this person. Well, this is exactly what happened to Rodney, only it's a lot worse. So on July 2nd of last year, Diddy hosted a listening party. And the people who attended this party were a couple of famous R&B singers, Diddy himself, Rodney, some professional female athletes, and quite a few uncooked eggs. So at around 7 p.m. that night, all these girls show up and they're mingling and mixing and talking to each other. And Puffy is very enthusiastically encouraging all these girls to drink some of his branded tequila, which unbeknownst to them, are all spiked with uh, some illegal stuff. According to Rodney, a lot of these will make you see stuff. So Rodney's there and he's mingling with people. And as he's talking to some of the girls, he gets the really weird feeling that a lot of them, at least five of them, are uncooked eggs. And he goes to Diddy and says, hey, you check all their IDs? And Diddy's like, nah, bruh, it's cool. And this makes Rodney feel very uncomfortable. So Rodney's like, yo, I'm out. And Puffy takes his car keys and forces him to stay. Not only that, but Diddy forces Jones to drink the exact same alcohol that all the other girls are drinking. And after a while, Jones completely blacks out. He wakes up 4 a.m. in the morning, butt ass naked. And when he turns and looks over, lying next to him is a professional female athlete, butt ass naked too. Hey, what got it going, Hall? You guys, whenever you go to parties, stay away from undercooked eggs, yo. Because this situation could have been a lot worse. What if Rodney woke up and that professional female athlete happened to be massively undercooked? He would be fucked. His life would be over. So in this instance, Diddy technically failed, but he would certainly try again. As in his next tactic, he would try something that I think almost every straight man would be impossible to say no to. I'm not wearing any panties. So, Thanksgiving 2022, Rodney is at Diddy's house in Miami. And as they're taking a break from working on the album, Diddy decides to have a little party. And he invites Young Miami, a platinum selling rapper who's one half of the City Girls rap group on Motown Records. And Young Miami also brings some very attractive relatives with her, one of them being her cousin. And as Diddy's there dancing, he's already drunk, and he offers Rodney some uh, baking soda. And Rodney's like, nah, fool, I gotta go pee. So Rodney heads to the bathroom, and as he's heading on this business, all of a sudden, one of young Miami's very attractive cousins busts into the restroom and starts seducing Rodney. And this is where I have to note that Rodney has yet to pull his pants up. And young Miami's cousin also notices this and she proceeds to uh, clean his drumstick. Now Rodney immediately assumes that Diddy is the one that sent her in there. So he refuses, he pushes her off and runs out of the restroom immediately. But young Miami's cousin was a very persistent young lady. She chased after Rodney into the living room. But here's the thing. Somehow between the trip from the bathroom to the living room, young Miami's cousin's clothes completely disappeared. How about that? <laughs> and as she's got Rodney cornered, Rodney, being a fairly small individual, eventually loses the struggle. Young Miami's cousin proceeds to pretend she is a cowgirl and Rodney is the horse she be riding into town. And this all went down while Diddy, his staff, 
and all the other people who attended the party cheered them on. Now Rodney eventually gets his bearings and manages to push young Miami's cousin off of him. And according to the lawsuit, there are video screenshots of all of this, including the part where Diddy tried to force him to consume some baking soda. Which leads us to the question, how does young Miami know Diddy? Well, as I mentioned before, young Miami is on Motown Records and Diddy's new album is also part of Motown Records. So technically they are part of the same company. Not only that, the word on the street is, is they were involved in a relationship at the time. Now, based on what we know so far, including from our previous cast, video, we understand the consequences of what's involved of working with Diddy long term. We also understand the vast network and influence he has to be able to convince people to do stuff they don't want to do. So I think from all this, we can start to understand how young Miami's cousin will be convinced to go after Rodney under Diddy's command. Now you have to remember, Rodney is a prodigy, so he's some kind of a genius, and he knew exactly the risks involved. If he were to agree to this interaction, or even give in to young Miami's cousin treating him like the horse and her being the cowgirl, then she would have access to his DNA, which means she could say any number of things, including claiming that he committed S.A. And with Young Miami, Diddy staff, and Diddy himself present, they could all claim themselves witnesses, which means Rodney would finally be compromised. So, to all our male viewers, remember, You better be careful! And I'm curious, if you happen to be at that party, and you saw Rodney pushing off Young Miami's very attractive and a uh, clothingless cousin, what's the first thing that might come to your mind? Nigga, you gay! Remember back in our Cassie episode, we talked about how she was sitting at the MTV Music Awards in Europe and the makeup artist, the hairdresser said to her, hey, Puffy's got a thing for you. And then fast forward to after the award ceremony and Diddy calls her up to his room to celebrate and he's wearing nothing but a bathrobe. Well, it turns out this is Diddy's M.O. You know, we used to be on the road, you know, you'd be like, yo, let me go over to my Puff room and see what they doing. You ever just had a grown ass man answer his hotel door butt naked and they'd be like, come on in. You'd be like, mm, I'll come back. Cause see what happened happens is if they be like come on in and then you come on in they be like this man just came into my room i'm sitting there butt ass naked i told him to come on in and he came on in you be like so what's going on for the day acting like you don't notice he did naked that's called the test off how you make sure you breaking in call the artist up here to the room tell him i'm gonna have a meeting by my tub he be in there by the tub and stuff soaking and stuff butt ass naked you be like how the hell i'm supposed to have a meeting with a nick butt naked in the tub Nah, man, come back, man. This is exactly what happened to Rodney, yo. Over the 13 months that he was living with Diddy, my man had to constantly fight off unwanted advances from Puffy, including him trying to touch them booty cheeks, as well as constant verbal sexual harassment. And this happened from LA to New York, to Miami, to even the Virgin Islands, dude. This man would not give up. He even forced Rodney to work on music on his laptop while Diddy was taking a shower in the bathroom. And let me tell you, that shower door was toming as fuck. Now Rodney, being a straight man and also a Christian, he did not take kindly to all this goofy behavior. And he actually tried to complain to Puffy's chief of staff, who happened to be a woman. This woman's name is Christina Kwam, AKA KK, AKA Puffy's Jelaine Maxwell. As according to this lawsuit, Christina Dina was in charge of getting all these girls, even the uncooked one, to show up at Puffy's events, as well as finding sources for the um, illegal stuff. And when Rodney went to KK and said, yo, the diddler's tripping, yo, he's on that gay shit, yo. I love Jesus. Do you know how this woman replied? So maybe, maybe Rodney shang tai duo, maybe Diddy's just messing around, horseplay, right? But here's the thing, whenever Diddy and Christina and Rodney were around in the same room and suddenly Diddy wanted to make himself more comfortable and take off all his clothes, being butt naked, that's when Christina said, This was completely contradictory. And Rodney saw this as KK tried to encourage Rodney to engage in uh, that stuff with uh, Diddy. Well, this definitely sounds familiar, doesn't it? Diddy using his staff to help him get what he wants? Both Rodney and Cassie's lawsuits have identical plot lines, yo. This is not a coincidence. This is a goddamn pattern of behavior. And as we mentioned in a previous episode, Diddy wasn't just doing this to Rodney for his own benefit. Eventually, According to Rodney, he would pass him off to Cuba Gooding Jr. Now, according to the lawsuit, which also has screenshots, which apparently comes from video, Cuba Gooding Jr. on a yacht with Rodney was very forward. He tried to touch them booty butt cheeks. He tried to touch all over the place, trying to get access to all of Rodney's goodies. And Rodney, feeling the pressure, because Cuba is a very powerful and famous celebrity, eventually, 
he pushed him off. But why would Diddy go through all this trouble? Maybe Diddy thought that Diddy wasn't Rodney's type, that maybe he needed someone that was more light-skinned, like Cuba Gooding Jr. You want white meat or dark meat? Either way, this is true. This is very damaging to Cuba Gooding Jr., who just barely survived the Me Too movement, yo. And in that trial, there were three women who came forward to testify until ultimately Cuba Gooding had to settle out of court. So it would seem that this fool also has a pattern of behavior. No matter not said whole new son, he's all about trying to get them Cuba goodies. But seeing as Cuba Gooding Jr.'s public image is that he is a red-blooded straight man, this could harm him even worse than the other one. So Diddy is very quickly running out of options. He's tried illegal substances, he's tried women, he's tried men, which means there's one more thing he's gonna try that many artists find it very hard to resist. The sin that the devil loves the most. Vanity. Definitely my favorite sin. So Sean Combs believed that he had one very important piece of information that he could use to finally convince Rodney Jones to join the dark side. You see, Rodney absolutely idolized one man. Stevie J. Check it. This guy was responsible for some of the biggest hits of the 1990s and 2000s, not just in hip hop or R&B, but also in modern pop music. This Grammy Award winning producer was signed to none other than Puff Daddy's Bad Boy Records. In fact, he was half of the reason why Diddy's first album was nominated for five Grammys and one rap album of the year. So needless to say, to Rodney, this guy was the ultimate old chef. And now, Diddy was gonna try and use this to manipulate Rodney into giving up them butt cheeks. Check it, this fool showed Rodney a video of Stevie J clapping the cheeks of some young white dude, and my man didn't even have a bag on his drumstick. See dog, in the music industry, everybody be clapping them man butt cheeks. Even your boy Stevie J be doing that gay shit. You gotta join us, dog. It's the only way you gonna get ahead, is to let us give you head. 20, 20, but I can't see 20, but I can't see Puff Daddy said, allegedly. And Diddy even went so far as to confess to Rodney that even he clapped some cheeks of some very famous R&B singers and rappers. Now, I ain't gonna say their names, but I'll put their photos up here and here. And I'll follow it up with the words, allegedly. And Diddy promised that if Rodney let Stevie J clap them cheeks, then he would definitely win producer of the year at the Grammy Awards. And here's where we notice a very interesting detail. Diddy very clearly knows that Rodney ain't about that gay shit. But nonetheless, he was still trying to convince him to do it anyway, all over a Grammy award. So this tricky devil was pulling out every tool in his bag to try and compromise this young producer. But still, it didn't work. Not even Lust in Vain could convince him to go to the dark side, which meant that Diddy was left with one choice. He had to use the most primitive and gangster method possible. Guns. Lots of guns. So after watching the previous video where Cassie suffered brutally at the hands of Diddy, it's pretty safe to say that Diddy is a very violent person. And what I'm about to reveal in Rodney's suit makes what he did to Cassie seem like child's play. On or around September 12th, 2022, Puffy held a producer and writer's camp at his studio in LA. And in attendance were Diddy, his son Justin Combs, their friend G, and of course, Rodney, as well as many other producers and writers. Now on one evening of the camp, while in the middle of recording session, Diddy, Justin and G got into an argument, and it got so bad that they took it out of the studio and into the restroom next door, leaving Rodney in the studio by himself. So he tried to drown out the noise and keep working on his music, but the arguing in the bathroom kept getting louder and louder until suddenly gunshots broke out. This completely freaked Rodney out, so he ran and he hid, and he waited for the gunshots to stop. And then eventually, after it did, it was completely silent, and all the producers and writers ran to the bathroom to see what happened. And out of the three men in that bathroom, only two people came out, Diddy and his son, Justin Combs. Where was G? He was lying on the floor in a pool of his own red stuff. And at this point, nobody seemed to want to rush to the aid of G, which prompted Rodney to run into the restroom and try to put pressure on the wounds. My man was leaking not only from his stomach, but from his leg and his hip. And this is where things get funky, because Diddy gave Rodney a very specific set of instructions. You tell the police that I had nothing to do with this, and that G, he got by a rival gang outside of the studio while having a smoke. So do you remember back in that last episode when Diddy was out of his mind on illegal stuff and he heard about Suge Knight was in town and he immediately went to his armory, grabbed some guns and went after him? Well, that, along with this, makes it very clear that Diddy is more than just a music producer who likes to clap them butt cheeks. He is also a very violent dude. My man's more like gangster. And this was proof. 
If my man was willing to fire off shots in a bathroom in a studio full of people, that means that he don't give a fuck. It also means that he has a lot of power. And he did not hesitate to share this with Rodney and explain just how much power he had. So soon after these events took place, Diddy, in a conversation with Rodney, made it very clear of his immense power. He said that he owned not only the music industry, but that he also owned the police. And that his head of security, Fahim Muhammad, had the ability to make problems and people disappear. And Diddy told Rodney that if he ever ran into any problems or if he was ever pulled over and harassed by the police, all he needed to do was call his boy Fahim and he would sort it all out. In fact, it's believed that Fahim is the one who talked to the police first in the incident where G got shot at the studio. And that even though the police saw the blood and saw everything in the bathroom of the studio and Fahim told them, nah man, he got shot outside of the studio by some gang in a car. The police were like, huh? Case closed. And Rodney witnessed all of this. He saw the police mill around for hours and investigate and ultimately making zero arrests and concluding that it was a rival gang. That G. Puffy had immense power. And Diddy reminded Rodney of this on multiple occasions. And there was one occasion where Diddy mentioned someone that everybody knows. J Lo. In this instance, Diddy was in his bedroom and he pulled out all of his guns and set them on the bed. And he called Rodney into his bedroom to look. And Diddy went on to brag about how powerful he was and how he even got away with shooting people. And he went on to detail an incident all the way back in 1999 at a club in New York where he got away with shooting someone involving a rapper on his label named Shine. And the woman who was there with him who snuck the gun in the club and handed it to Diddy? Jennifer Lopez, AKA J-Lo. And here's the thing about this story. Back in 1999, when Diddy went by Puff Daddy, he was in a very publicized relationship with Jennifer Lopez. And these two, along with rapper Shine, went to a local New York club to get down and party. And Diddy, making his way in, accidentally bumped into a guy and knocked down his drink. This guy turned out to be a gang member and ex-convict, Scar. And these two had words, to the point where Diddy pulled out a water cash and threw it in his face. Or maybe it was Scar who threw out a water cash and threw it in his face. Depends on which report you read. Either way, this eventually escalated and gunshots broke out. Several victims were hit, including one woman who caught a stray in the nose. More on her later. So when this went down, Diddy and JLo fled the scene. They hopped into his truck and took off. But unfortunately, in their hurried attempt to put distance between them and that club, Diddy ran a red light, and that caused the police to pull them over. When the police smelled alcohol in his breath, he instructed them to get out of the car, he searched the vehicle, and in the trunk, he found a nine millimeter pistol. And as a result, both Diddy and J-Lo were arrested and put in jail for 14 hours. This made headlines everywhere. After the trial, both J-Lo and Diddy were cleared. They were not charged with anything. All the blame was put on the rapper Shine. My man did 10 years in prison. During that time, he maintained his innocence, claiming that Diddy set him up. And even Diddy's former bodyguard at the time corroborates this information. Puff had witnesses that come in to testify against Sean and say they saw Sean do the shooting. And, and the case is over with. It's been, what, about 20 some years. They can't reopen that shit and charge him. I believe Diddy did Sean wrong because he told security at the time. If y'all know somebody who was there at the club that witnessed the shooter, go find them. And brought in to Puff. When Puff liked their story, what they saw, he gave it to their lawyer. Their lawyer then sent them to the DA's office and those people testified against Sean. They had the same charges. They had separate lawyers and everything went on Sean because Diddy found the witness against Sean and brought him forward. So I guess that's how you do your man when you don't want to go to jail. So it would seem that this bodyguard's information directly matches what Rodney said in his suit. Not only that, but Diddy's former bodyguard says that if this goes to trial, he will absolutely testify against Diddy. Now, when it comes to rapper Shine, my man is already out of prison and check this, he is an elected member of the House of Representatives for his home country in Belize. My man is now a politician. So if this thing does go to trial, it'll be interesting to see whether or not Shine will go and testify. Oh, and do you remember that woman who was at the club who caught a stray whenever shots popped off? Well, she recently came forward and what she's about to say will completely blow you away. I am the woman who he shot in the face in that 1999, December 27th, 1999, Club New York. I have told everyone ad nauseum since then, I watched him fire the gun. Even the surgeon who did my surgery to take out 
part of the bullet fragments that was aspirating into my lungs and try to remove as many bullet fragments as possible testified in the criminal trial that while they were putting me under, I was screaming puffy, pew, pew, me in the face. It is in the record. They all knew he did it. Everybody knew he did it, but he paid off the club bouncer named Sharice and all these other people and the club owners with their video to hide the video. That's his MO. It took 24 years for him to come out and say it. I've been saying it all along. What she is saying is true. The And what she's about to say next could blow this case wide open and probably put her back on Diddy's number one shit list. If I, I'm willing to have a doctor remove a part of the nine millimeter bullet in my face so that they can use it as evidence if need be for this trial. And you it may are. cost me my you life. You would be willing to do that I'm now? I'm willing to do it. Oh my gosh. So what do they have to say to that? So from threatening and intimidating people to paying people off to hiding guns, it would appear that Diddy has a very clear pattern of behavior. Just like what he did to Cassie, where he forced her to carry his guns, he apparently did the same with JLo. But luckily, JLo was smart enough. And as soon as his trial was done, she got out of there. She broke up with him and never looked back. But here's the thing. Many people are starting to suspect that maybe JLo was subjected to many of the same things that Cassie was subjected to. So possibly, maybe he even has tapes on JLo as well. And when he lost JLo, maybe Cassie was just her replacement. She was a facsimile JLo. And what's even crazier is that if you put both of their pictures side by side, JLo and Cassie Ventura look very similar. They're both Latin. They're both singers. They both dated Diddy. But this is all speculation. What do you guys think? Let me know down below. I love this game! So as I mentioned earlier, this lawsuit is pretty much a how-to guide on how to control and influence people. And this next part is very important. You see, during the 13 months when Roddy was traveling and living with Diddy producing his album, he discovered something very crucial. Diddy had cameras in every single room of his house. And Roddy began to think of all the people that came in and out of his house and stayed overnight for his freak off parties. And then he realized Diddy must have recordings of KK, his chief of staff, the CEO of Motown, and the CEO of Universal Music Group, which would explain why all three of them allegedly enabled Diddy to commit his crimes. And the potential list of recordings that Diddy has on people in very compromising positions goes well beyond that. Not only celebrities, he had politicians in there. He had princes in there. He also had a couple of preachers in there. <laughs> Allegedly. Now, we don't know what tapes Diddy has on who or even if these tapes really exist. Word on the street is, is that Jay-Z, Beyonce, and Prince Harry himself were very frequent guests of Diddy's famous parties. So if these tapes do exist, you can rest for damn sure that Diddy has some very powerful leverage. And due to the vast library that very well may be in his possession, it's very clear that Diddy thinks he's not only above the law, but completely untouchable. And according to the lawsuit, and also the result of Rodney's deep digging and own personal investigation, all these tapes are being gatekept by Diddy's IT director. And this guy is a complete ghost. No Twitter, no Facebook, no IG or Snapchat. My man hides behind the camera because he knows that he is in complete possession of all the damning evidence of some of the most powerful people in the entertainment industry. Do you remember back in that series, Sherlock, where there was that dominatrix who had all the incriminating tapes and evidence of some of the most powerful people in the UK? Well, Diddy is the real life version of that. If all this is true, he's been collecting all this incriminating evidence on people for at least 20 years, making him almost unstoppable. And with him involving his staff and even his own son engaging in these criminal activities, from intimidation to drugging to hiring professional athletes, all of these actions fall under one very important thing, the RICO Act. And let me tell you, when it comes to the RICO Act, this has a 90% conviction rate, yo. So if Homeland Security or the FBI decides to charge D with this, he is fucked. So with all this risky behavior and all these receipts on these very influential, powerful people and their reputations at stake, that leaves one very important question. How long can Diddy stay alive? Oh, I'm a savage. Whatever I want, I'm going to get. Whatever I want, I have to get. So do you remember a while back there was that guy of um, Jewish descent and he had a very private island and he also had a very private plane and a very giant private palace with a big blue roof. And he would invite his very powerful and rich and influential friends to come to his parties. I think one of them was a politician. 
The other was like the head of a giant tech company and they're both named Bill. Well, this is where I came up with the name P. Diddlesteed because where that guy was the Eden, Diddy is the Yang. Literally, hey bye. And both of these people have one thing in common, a British prince. Yeah, I wonder what ever happened to that guy. Well, Diddy is now in the very same predicament. He has very damning evidence on a lot of powerful and influential people. Now that evidence is in the hands of Homeland Security and the FBI. And that puts Diddy in a very dangerous situation. Shit, I don't even know if he'll be able to make it to watch Snow White in 2025. Weird, weird. Now apparently, it ain't just me. And you knowing him, do you think it's possible that he might commit suicide? When you are a narcissist, there's always a possibility because you're suffering. But I don't think he can see himself behind those bars in those type of situations. It's too many real dudes that dislike him. This thing is constantly developing, yo. And with Cassie's lawsuit and now Rodney's lawsuit, everyone is waiting to see exactly what the federales are gonna charge P. Diddlestein with. And I believe it can only go uphill from here, at least for us. For Diddy, it's going all the way downhill. And as this continues to go down, more and more people on the internet are starting to find bits and pieces of old interviews and hanging on every words that other celebrities have said that were in close proximity to P. Diddy. And recently, some very curious netizens have been connecting the dots between Justin Bieber to Diddy. And in our next episode, we're gonna take a very close look to see what these dots are. So make sure you stick around for that. Remember to like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the flip side. Peace.